So uh, it's a real pleasure to have George Onkopoulos uh, here today with us. Uh, most importantly, George got his MD PhD here at Columbia and did his PhD with uh, Fred Ault. Uh, so uh, George is a co-founder, president, and chief scientific officer of Regeneron Pharmaceuticals and uh, using uh, novel technology that uh, was developed there uh, by George and colleagues uh, to develop humanized antibodies in mice uh, has led to the uh, FDA approval of at least uh, six uh, uh, <coughs> treatments, uh, medications, uh, based on this antibody technology. Uh, so Regeneron is running some of the most important COVID-19 clinical trials, and it's a great uh, pleasure to have George here today to update us on the trials. So, um, well, thanks, Andy. Um, as Andy said, I'm, I'm a longtime Columbia um, um, person. I, I bleed, you know, blue and white. I uh, was an, I actually started in high school. I went to the, uh, uh, the scholars program that Columbia has. I went to undergrad. I did the MD. I did the PhD. I was a postdoc. I was a junior faculty. So I was there for about 15 years before I, I left to join Regeneron, but my heart is still with, with uh, Columbia in many ways. Now, I told Andy I wasn't going to use slides, but then I made a few slides, so I hope I'm going to be able to show them. So I'm going to try to share my screen. So I, I figured I would update what we're doing at Regeneron uh, and put in the context of obviously what we're all doing together in the ecosystem. I think this is a great opportunity for all of us, you know, from academia, from great medical institutions, from the NIH, from all the companies to really come together. And I really see that that's happening. And I really do think that ultimately what we all believe we need is a, a safe and effective vaccine. Um, that is something that we are not directly working on. Um, but uh, obviously, that's what I think we all believe we're going to ultimately really need here. Um, and and as many have said, including T Tony Fauci, uh, that the problem is that it takes a while to make a safe and effective vaccine that can be widely available. It could still be a couple of years away. And so our approaches are um, short-term approaches that we think could have major impact until the, the so-called active vaccines uh, can arrive. Um, and we're taking on two approaches in that regard. Uh, or two major approaches. We're doing a few other things as well, but two major approaches. Uh, one is, you know, using these repurposed drugs, as people say. So obviously, when, you know, this epidemic hit China and they were desperate, they were trying everything. Um, somebody over there had a had the clever idea that this lung inflammation that seems to be causing a lot of the problems, um, uh, leading to all this respiratory distress and all the hospitalized patients on ventilators and so forth, that it might be driven by excess auto-inflammation, not the virus itself, but the body's excessive response to it driven by the IL-6 pathway. Um, and this was based on anecdotal evidence showing that severe and critical COVID-19 patients who were in respiratory distress treated with an anti-IL-6 receptor antibody, in particular an antibody known as Actimra, also known as tocilizumab by Shugai Roche, and approved for rheumatoid arthritis and also used for cytokine release syndrome, uh, showed in their uncontrolled experience impressive improvement on average in a series of 21 uncontrolled patients. That generated a lot of excitement that maybe this could make a difference, particularly for these sickest patients who are obviously at the highest risk and have the most um, uh, problems. And as Regeneron had the only other FDA-approved anti-IL-6 receptor antibody known as Kivzara, um, it also goes by the generic name Cerilimab uh, that was uh, invented by us and um, developed collaboratively with Sanofi. Uh, because we had the only other FDA-approved IL-6 receptor antibody, uh, everybody really got together, the FDA, BARDA, BARDA is the rapid response arm of the Department of Health and Human Services, uh, other parts of the federal government. Uh, New York State got involved. Governor Cuomo directly called us up and was telling us we got to try this. Um, and he helped get all the great New York State medical institutions, including Columbia, all on board and unified 
to initiate in, in, in record time, literally in probably less than a week, uh, a well-controlled clinical trial to determine if this IL-6 receptor antibody approach really benefits COVID-19 patients. Um, what I can say is just that um, it's very hard. Now looking across all of the anecdotal studies with using a variety of approaches that have been, uh, have been described, it's really hard to say whether any or all of them work because the data for all of them in these anecdotal studies all looks about the same. So it could just be the average experience or it could be that they're all working. So, um, so I think this is why everybody felt it was so important to really do a, a, a well-controlled, placebo-controlled study so that we could really understand whether this is really a weapon against this terrible disease. And uh, we worked and the FDA encouraged us to undertake a adaptive phase two, three design. This is something that really, because here, and I, I think this, you know, the FDA were great partners in this effort, as was everybody else. And we talked it over with folks from Columbia and from the other institutions, because everybody felt that nobody knew how this disease really worked. We couldn't design endpoints prospectively. Normally you have a study and you decide what you're gonna study and so forth, and you have your endpoints. And so what the FDA actually challenges to do to have an adaptive design, where we do a phase two portion, uh, which is gonna have roughly 400 patients, and then we're gonna all look at the data together. And from that, we're gonna generate a hypothesis, which we will then test in the phase three. But the beauty of this design is we will have already enrolled and treated uh, the phase three patients why we're now gonna be looking together with the FDA and with our collaborators um, at the phase two data uh, to, to, to figure out what the endpoint is. So we're totally blinded to, we'll be totally blinded to the phase three, but we will then generate the hypothesis and the endpoints. And then essentially within probably a week or two of the phase two data, we'll be able to unmask or unblind the phase three and see whether the hypothesis generated in phase two works. So, this is really, I think, a great example of everybody coming together throughout the whole ecosystem, everybody partnering together and doing a study, not only in, in, in record time, but using, I think, this really innovative approach um, to say, hey, you do one study to figure out what your endpoints are going to be while you're still enrolling and treating your phase three patients. So, of course, we hope this approach works, but at least it'll be the first it will probably be the first definitive controlled study, certainly in this space, in terms of the IL-6 receptor antibody space, uh, and, and maybe any of these repurposed drugs. So I think it'll be very important to see what's going on here. So that's one major approach. I'm not gonna talk much more about it, but I'll be glad to take questions at the end. The other approach, which is a targeted approach, and of course, we always think, we believe that these targeted approaches um, tend to have a higher chance of success. And in our case, with this target approach, we've done it quite a few times already before, uh, most recently and notably for Ebola, but we also did it with the MERS coronavirus and a couple of other viruses. And we did this collaboratively with BARDA again uh, over the course of the last five to 10 years. So we have a lot of hope that regardless of what happens with the repurposed drug approach, this targeted approach has a real chance of working. And it takes advantage of literally decades of technology development that have empowered this approach. And Andy referred to these technologies. Um, basically, they use a, they start with a genetically humanized mouse called the Velocimune mouse that's capable of making fully human antibodies. And the connection to Columbia is there uh, when I was working with Fred Alt, we're the ones who actually thought of literally making the first human antibody mouse back in 1985. And we've been working on that simple concept and developing it since then. And we use a very related technology base uh, that also takes advantage of convalescent humans. So we believe we're the only um, group or company in the world that has the ability of simultaneously um, making fully human antibodies against anything, and including infectious agents and viruses, both in this genetically humanized mouse environment, but also harvesting them in a very high throughput fashion from convalescent humans as well. And uh, I think that right now, most people believe that 
our technology is the fastest and best in class. And uh, this has been certainly demonstrated for Ebola. And the same technology, as Andy mentioned, um, has been involved in multiple other FDA approved drugs. In fact, Kevzara, which is what we're trying, you know, which is the repurposed drug that we're trying here, um, was developed using this technology. In fact, it was the first target that we actually de developed, believe it or not, uh, about 20 years ago with this technology. But also, you know, important drugs like Dupixin for allergic disease and asthma, and Praluent uh, for um, heart disease and, um, and, and cholesterol. So, so this technology is really tried and true. And I think, you know, it's important for you guys to, the, the connections to Columbia are not only long-term, they run deep and, and they just continue. I mean, Columbia really is a, a sister institution for us. It's a pipeline. Um, I get a lot of your best people uh, come, come and join us here. And in fact, um, this effort, and he also led the Ebola effort, and he also led the MERS effort, is a relatively recent, well, I say relatively recent, 10 years ago, um, graduate um, from Columbia, Christos Kiratsus, who was actually in my department that I, you know, I got, I worked and he worked with Saul Silverstein. Uh, and then he joined us and he's been leading our infectious disease efforts since then. So this is really a strong Columbia related uh, linked uh, uh, approach in technology. So I just thought I would actually show you some of our uh, update of our progress, particularly with the targeted antiviral antibody approach. And I notice a lot of misspellings. I'm sorry, I literally put these slides together in the last 15 minutes. Sorry about all the misspellings. But anyway, so um, we had, I believe, um, you know, set the world record in starting an anti-infectious process and getting um, uh, into clinical trials with the Ebola project, which was nine months. We hope to cut that timeline almost in half here. So we have already created and selected um, actually multiple very potent antiviral antibody cocktails in record time, both from our genetically humanized velocity mice, as well as from convalescent humans. And this is our actual achieved timeline uh, that we've done. So basically, we, Christos and his group, they immunized the velocity mice on February 5th. Um, and 70 days from then, we now picked our antibody cocktail. And um, for humans, the humans were actually immunized, not by us, but by nature. So they probably, they started about the same time because they had been, these are people who were about a month out after they started showing symptoms. So the humans were immunized about the same time and using the same amount of time now, um, we isolated um, antibodies from them as well. So uh, we screened literally thousands of antibody pairs that we put into CHO lines. So for those of you who know how this technology works, it usually takes at least six to 12 months to make a manufacturing quality cell line that can actually produce antibodies. Uh, we actually can do it essentially overnight. And we can do it for thousands of antibodies at the same time, all harvested from either the mouse or the human. So we literally, as shown on the slide, we isolated and screened thousands of antibodies. Uh, we came up with hundreds of very potent neutralizers, and we selected a combination of these um, for our antibody cocktail, which we're now selecting for large-scale uh, production and with the intent to be in human trials, in human prophylaxis trials, early treatment trials, and late treatment trials uh, by June, uh, which we really think can, can really start making a difference. Um, this just shows the in vitro summary. The data is, is just very impressive, I guess. You don't need to focus on, on, on most of these, but basically all of these IC50s are in the picomolar range. So these are as good antibodies as you could possibly get. Um, they've already been tested, so Chrysos' group we are very automated and we're very high throughput here. So people always worry about mutants. So Christos has already tested his antibodies against all of the published uh, mutants in the receptor binding domain um, of the coronaviruses that have been known and sequenced and published. And it turns out that all the antibodies that we selected work against all of the mutants and variants described so far. 
So that's really exciting. Plus our cocktail puts together two non-competing um, variants, uh, non-competing antibodies, meaning that you would have to mutate against both of them to get resistance because our cocktail is a mix. We have two cocktails of two different antibodies. Each antibody binds to a different part of the receptor binding domain. And that's shown here. We already have structural data uh, that shows where our antibodies bind. So on the top, the purple is where the spike protein, the spike protein is in white, and in purple is where it binds to its natural receptor, the ACE2 receptor. And what we show EC1, that's epitope class one, you can see that those antibodies, uh, and we in all of our cocktails, we use an antibody from EC1, that almost completely overlaps with the binding epitope for the ACE2. And then the other EC class is partially uh, to varying degrees overlap. So we're mixing antibodies from these two different, from multiple classes together, one always from EC1, one from another class to make our two cocktails. So we're literally mimicking um, the receptor with these antibodies, blocking it from being able to bind. We've actually compared our antibodies. Um, they seem to actually work better than, for example, using a soluble ACE2 or something like that. So there's already, Structural information, this is the cross competition. This is how we choose the antibodies. So in red, if two antibodies block each other, you can't put them in the same cocktail because they're binding in an overlapping fashion. So a single point mutation could essentially obliterate binding to both antibodies. We're picking, we picked for our cocktail combinations of antibodies that don't block each other. Um, and, and, and so that it would be very hard then to get a variant um, that simultaneously loses the ability to bind to two of our antibodies in the cocktail. So, so that was um, my attempt to summarize uh, our efforts. As I said, I mean, it's two major approaches. Uh, the goal is that they could have real short-term impact until the active vaccines arrive. And um, the targeted antiviral approach, I should, just say once again, some people can term it a passive vaccine. I mean, the whole goal of a vaccine is to generate highly potent neutralizing antibodies. That is what we are providing with this antiviral antibody cocktail, highly potent neutralizing antibodies. We're giving them in pairs uh, to increase the chances of not only blocking, but ensuring against mutant escape. Um, this approach has worked for even worse diseases like Ebola. I mean, just to remind you, our approach was used in the World Health Organization study in the Congo, and it showed that um, we could save people who were in the earlier stages of infection for Ebola, we could save more than 90% of them, and we could save more than half of the people who were in the late stages of infection. So if it worked in Ebola, uh, it has, I think, a good chance of working here. And of course, we've shown before, based on our Ebola work, our MERS work, we did the same thing for RSV. These things are even more potent and powerful to prevent disease and prophylaxis as passive vaccines. Um, so we are going to do actually simultaneously, we're hoping to initiate three separate clinical trials of prophylaxis, meaning we're gonna take uninfected people. So for example, we are now designing and working with people at Columbia and other places to design a prophylaxis trial, maybe a, for example, healthcare workers, and other first responders and critical care workers that are high risk, we can prophylax them and prove that that can prevent in, in, you know, infection in these people. So these people could then start going to work without the fear um, that they have a high chance of, of being infected. So there will be the prophylaxis trial. We're also gonna do an early treatment trial. That is, we're gonna take patients who, and there's a lot of them who come to the emergency rooms or come to the, the hospitals or whatever, and they're sent away because they're not in severe respiratory distress or they're sent home. We're gonna treat those people, hopefully show that we can prevent, and some of them end up having to come back to the hospital and go on ventilators and so forth. So we're gonna hopefully show that in these early patients, we can uh, prevent them from having to progress and having to go back to the hospital and so forth, which I think could be a big contribution. And then we're also trying it in the so-called severe and critical people who are in respiratory distress, where the same exact people that we're already now doing in this trial at Columbia and Mount Sinai and other places, 
uh, to see whether we can take the people who are in respiratory distress already in the hospital on ventilators and maybe help them get off. So that summarizes you know, our major efforts. We're, we're doing some sequencing projects in collaboration with Columbia and others. Uh, we're doing some serology projects. Um, if anybody has questions, we can talk about these. All of these things are in collaborations with the ecosystem. I think this is, you know, this has been a great time where, like I said, I can call, you know, my counterpart, Michael Dolston at Pfizer, and, you know, he answers the phone and says, what can, what can we do together to help? You know, we call up, you know, people at Columbia, we call up people at Mount Sinai or, you know, across the continent or, you know, across the ocean. We, we call up people in Italy and England. All, all everybody wants to do is figure out how to get together and work together to do this. So this has been, a, I think, a great opportunity to show the collaborative spirit that our ecosystem can do. And hopefully our ecosystem will deliver here and show the world that, you know, together we can make a difference. Thank you, George. This was both uh, inspiring and uh, uplifting. Um, there's quite a number of uh, questions, as we, one would expect. Uh, so Darcy, Kelly, um, you should be able to talk now. Okay, so an observation and a question. So here's the observation. I was on the New York Genome Center uh, Symposium the, the other day, and there was a very interesting observation, which was if you looked at nasal swabs, what you discovered was that there were some patients in which all of the RNA you got out was viral RNA. So that's a huge infectious load. And the other observation that was really interesting was that when you then deep sequence the cellular responses, what you discovered was there, was there were no interferon regulated genes. They were all cytokine regulated genes, mostly IL-6. So I thought that was interesting and ties in very much with what you guys see. My question is, have you done for neutralization studies on human cell lines that would mimic nasal epithelium or mucosal tissues to see that the antibodies reduce viral replication? Yeah. Um, so that is, those are fundamentally our assays. We don't necessarily do them on nasal. So the question was, so there was a couple points in a question. So what Darcy said was she was at a meeting at the New York Genome Center, which had said that it looks like it's possible that maybe the interferon response is downregulated, um, unfortunately, perhaps, uh, in these patients when they do um, uh, assays looking at nasal and lung tissue. And, uh, and on the other hand, IL-6 and other cytokines are dramatically up upregulated. And that is one of the basis of the rationales for this approach that we're undertaking. I mean, the question is, is that correlative or is it really driving the problem here? And that's what our study will, will, will actually directly test and figure out. Um, so that was the one for Darcy's first point. Her next question is, uh, because there seems like there's in some patients very high replication in the nasal epithelium and so forth, have we actually tested whether our antibodies neutralize nasal epithelium replication. We have tested our antibodies for blocking replication, um, but not in nasal epithelial cultures. That's not really something that we do. We do do in vivo studies. Um, and so far, I mean, our most relevant in vivo experience is in MERS. I mean, we had to knock in, um, and once again, this was work that was led by Christos, um, we knocked in the MERS receptor, the DPP4 receptor, and then we showed that the mice now had a very human-like lung response in terms of the disease uh, and the characteristics and the histopathology of the infection. And we were able to essentially completely block it with prophylaxis or actually treat it in a treatment model where the animals were already sick. We have done the same thing for um, the SARS-2 in that we've knocked in the ACE2 receptor, um, and we are now doing exactly those studies. Fortunately or unfortunately, we hope to be in man uh, or humans and be getting those results probably about the same time we're going to be getting the mouse results. So um, because the need is so urgent and so many people you know, are at such high risk that the FDA is going to allow us to go forward with our human studies without having the normal kind of um, animal 
um, package that you normally have uh, to justify it. So we are doing the direct animal experiment, but I actually hope that we get a positive result in humans first. Thank you, Drew. In the interest of time, we're going to take four more questions. Uh, we have Andy Marks, uh, Kevin uh, Neville Kleins, and Ira Tabas, and Saul Silverstein. And then the remaining question, please post them on the Q&A, and we'll communicate them to Dr. Yakopoulos. So George just answered my question that uh, going essentially, uh, I was wondering if you're going directly from uh, in vitro work to humans, which is obviously extraordinary extraordinarily unusual uh and you just answered that so it's pretty amazing uh, and i do want to mention there's over 500 people on this call so there's a lot of other questions and i'll pass it on well i should say that the fda is i mean we have discussed it with the fda and we are going to be doing a small monkey toxicology package before we go into man just to be sure uh but the the one point that that everybody should recognize, and obviously, I mean, this is one reason why the FDA is, is allowing us to do this, is we have a lot of experience with making antibodies against targets that are not normally in humans. And, and so those antibodies tend not to have toxicology because they don't bind anything in the human, they just float around just like all of our other antibodies normally do. So they are gonna have us do a small um, uh, toxicology package to be safe, but what, what we are going ahead with is without the usual, you know, pharmacology sort of experiments, you know, showing exactly what Darcy asked, um, we will probably have that data about the same time we're going to be getting data from humans. Uh, Jahar Bhattacharya and David Ho have been discussing a very interesting question, George. Uh, do these antibodies get inside the alveoli? And, 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 and do you think that that's necessary? You know, that's a... That's a great question. Um, all we can say is that exactly these approaches have seemingly worked um, in humans, for example, we've made these exact sort of antibodies against RSV, respiratory syncytial virus, uh, and they seem to have been, those were in prophylaxis studies, they seem to be very effective in prophylaxis there. Um, and we, we did do human uh, safety studies, but fortunately the MERS epidemic never manifested in the United States. But in animal studies, the MERS antibodies um, got into the lungs and either prevented or controlled infection there. So it's a great question. I think that what we all are presuming is even if they don't naturally, they're not like IgAs that get transported in secretions. But I think what everybody imagines and what the data suggests is whenever you have any sort of inflammation, there's sort of a breakdown of whatever normal barriers exist and IgGs just go there. Uh, and so the hope is that wherever there's any disease and there's any inflammation or even the beginning of an infection, barriers break down, IgGs get in there and they can you know, sort of sop it up. That's the hope, I mean, until, <laughs> Until, I mean, we haven't even done it for this virus, even in the animal models, uh, as we just said, and we haven't, of course, done it in man. So the, these are why this is, as we all know, this is a biology, and especially this is very early biology. So that's why there's no guarantees, but it's a great question, and, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll find out. Neville, I see that you're unmuted now. Uh, do you want to yes. ask a question? Yes, I would. Um, could you comment on your thought on the possible pathogenesis role of antibody dependent enhancement and whether uh, these antibodies, do you have any concern regarding that? Yeah, so we, we had a, a large Zika program, which is related to dengue, which is where you have the most problems with that. Once again, that was also led by Christos. Um, and basically, um, we, I mean, that's a great question. We could talk about it forever, we could debate it, Trust me, we had a lot of internal debates on this. It is, once again, it's always a concern until you prove for sure that it's not a concern. Um, but that said, um, the receptors for these viruses are not found in macrophages and neutrophils. So, uh, and we've shown in vitro, you don't get that sort of ADE that you see with 
with dengue and with Zika viruses and so forth. Number two is um, where there's other kinds, there's many kinds, there's many ways that antibodies can actually enhance a viral infection. So for example, if you have poorly neutralizing antibodies that sort of just carry the virus along and actually protect it in the bloodstream, but they don't neutralize it, we've actually seen evidence, even in human trials, that that can actually create enhancement. That's a problem. Our hope here, and like I said, we have some data, but you know, until it's really done and then done in a rigorous, well-controlled study, we won't know that when you use these highly potent picomolar, very specific neutralizing antibodies, that you don't see these sorts of enhancement problems. But those are in the models that we've tested. So until you go into the actual humans and you see them, that will remain a concern. I think we've been doing everything that we can to get data and to argue against it and that it hopefully will not be a problem, but we shall, unfortunately, hopefully we won't see it and uh, it won't be a problem, but it's an issue. Thank you. One last uh, uh, quick question from Sol Silverstein. George, my question for you is, what's the half-life of these antibodies? What do we know from the MERS studies in the Ebola? If you're gonna use these in uh, people who are going to be highly susceptible to infection or exposed to large loads of virus, um, how often are they going to have to be treated? You know, these, these are all also great questions, and we can only model and based on our previous experience. I should say, I already mentioned Saul. Um, you know, we wouldn't be here. We wouldn't be doing this if it wasn't for Saul. As I said, I was in his department, and Christos uh, came directly from his lab. So uh, we have deep roots there. Uh, so much thanks. But, uh, yeah, these are all great questions. We are doing, all of the three studies that I mentioned are dose ranging. What we're doing is based on our experience with MERS, with Ebola, with respiratory syncytial virus in man, as well as all of our animal studies, we're taught, so our, the half, what we do know is the half-life of our antibodies are three to four weeks in man, okay? And what we're targeting is, is that we should, we're, we're trying to target that at a month, we will be in way overkill. Um, so that we're trying to model a system that we think that prophylaxis antibodies, if they can't last at least a month, don't have much use. So, so we're targeting a minimal profile of a month. But as I said, like with RSV, one of our antibodies seemed to last four to five months, if not longer, in terms of because how potent it was, the blood level that you needed, and its half-life. So um, our minimal profile is to last a month, um, but if these antibodies are as potent as we think they are, and they last as long as they, we think they're gonna last and so forth, that it, it, it could be longer effective. But this is why all of our trials, we're gonna, you know, unfortunately for those of you, I'm sure many of you participated in clinical trials, you know, we're literally going into what would be, be considered phase three trials with, you know, as much information as you have going into phase one trial. So we're going to be doing dose ranging in our phase three trials, just in case we're wrong about all of these models and all of these um, presuppositions that we're making to address Saul's question. Thank you. Thank you very much, George. It's been really a pleasure. There are many more questions that have been asked, but unfortunately you're running out of time. So I've asked all the remaining participants who had questions for you to send them to us. To the Q&A box and we'll forward it to you. Hopefully you'll have time uh, to respond. 